Well, let's see how well I do at capturing what you wrote in your journals. When it comes to relational behaviors, human beings are not terribly different from most animals. We make very quick decisions based on some fairly simple behaviors to determine whether or not we're going to be friend or foe with a new person that comes into our life, or even somebody we're familiar with and haven't seen in a short while. So for people, we have the equivalent of perky ears and wagging tails. And these behaviors, while subtle to others, are really important to the people who are engaged in this interaction. One of the curious things that you will probably find as you encounter people with mental health needs, especially those in crisis, is that they may not necessarily be adept in that particular moment at displaying a strong suite of relational behaviors. They may not necessarily be good at some or all of these. And that might be because they are in the throes of a use of a substance or because they're suffering from acute mental health symptoms at that time. Perhaps they have a developmental disability. Perhaps their socialization is different because they perhaps may, came from, may have come from a different cultural background. Or maybe they're just a younger person who hasn't yet refined their social skills. All of these things can suggest that a person may not be at their best when it comes to communicating to you that they are present with you, respectful of you, and eager to align with you. That's why you're going to need to be a bit more accepting and understanding of their liabilities in this area. Conversely, you're going to have to be a little bit more sharp in terms of your relational behaviors because that person's often going to be sort of on alert, really, really aware of whether or not you're demonstrating in a concrete way that you can be trusted. And you can't say to people, I can be trusted, because that often has the opposite effect. Many of the people you'll support have gone through experiences where people have, in their perception, betrayed them. And so they're going to be watching carefully. Even though they may not be able to execute these behaviors in that moment, they will usually be very aware of whether you're doing so effectively. So there are seven different areas we want to look at. The first one is our verbal communication. In other words, the words that we use. And we're going to look a little bit more in the next module at work done by Mirabian and the analysis he did around what parts of communication people really responded to the most. Often we put our biggest focus on verbal communication when in fact it's not the piece that people look at the most. Still, it is an important area and it's important for us to think not only about what we should say but what we should avoid. And I want us to focus on avoiding flag words and jargon. Flag words are simply words that are likely to elicit an inflamed negative response. Even if the person who used the language didn't need to offend, sometimes they're going to get that response anyways. And these fall into two categories. The first category are just obvious words. And these words are not commonly used by professionals because they simply aren't professional. We don't normally, for example, tell people that they're fat or stupid because we know that those are flags. We know that they're communicating disrespect and we wouldn't use them. But there are a number of words that fall into our second category that are more insidious or subtle. And we use them often professional to professional, without thinking about how they may be perceived by a consumer. And these are words such as policy or appropriate. And those words can be words that uh, many consumers become sensitized over the years to. They signify to them that they are the less powerful person in an interaction. And they're often vague or not very concrete in terms of descri describing why the individual should be listening to or, or following along with what the professional is communicating. Now, we're getting into that in far more detail in modules three and four. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on that today, but we will look at flag words in more detail. Jargon simply refers to technical language. And for us in the community mental health services or in first response, we often use not just jargon and technical language, but a whole raft of abbreviations. It's funny sometimes how much we seem to love our mnemonic names like uh, ERT and e EDP and so forth. The problem with those is that while they might simplify communication from one colleague to another, they have the impact to the consumer of making them feel as though there is an effort to try and disinclude them in the communication to make sure they don't understand what's going on. And so instead, we should try to use as much as we can plain language, both to the consumer and in the presence of the consumer, trying hard to make sure they understand exactly what's going on so that we don't build unnecessary anxiety.
And in fact, we should use empowering words, words that indicate to the person that you want to hear their opinion, want to find out what they want and hear their choices and let them know what they're going to have a chance to make a decision. Those kinds of words can be very powerful for individuals, letting them know that they are going to be playing an active role in determining what happens to them. Now, I know that we cannot always give people the choices that they want, but we should still be looking wherever possible to give them the choices that are, are available. And sometimes those choices may need a little bit of creativity for us to actually identify them. Nonverbal communication is at least, if not more important than verbal communication. And as I said, we'll be looking more at that in subsequent modules. Think about the stuff that we do with our body. For example, how do we approach an individual or stand when we're near them? We're going to talk a little bit about the supportive stance. The supportive stance is something I will display for you in a video clip that will be attached to the Moodle platform. But the supportive stance really refers to an approach to a person that's going to have three main benefits. Essentially, we're going to be standing sideways to a person as opposed to chest to chest. Our head can be turned facing them, but our body, after we've approached them, will be more or less in a L shape or T shape to theirs. And we're going to stand approximately one's le one leg length away from that individual for three primary reasons. The first reason is that our whole rate of approach and stance is going to communicate to the individual that we are a friend. We should not be perceived as a threat. And so by standing in that way, we're going to give a person a feeling that they're not being closed in. We are not trying to impose our physical presence on them. Second, if you think about it, it's going to be simply safer for us. If I'm standing facing a person chest to chest, every vital target on my body is closer and easier to access, and it's presented directly to that person. And particularly if I'm standing within that one legs length distance, not only does one legs length normally equate to a feeling for people of respect for their personal space, but it also keeps me a distance away from the likely punch or kick that could happen if a person gets more and more escalated. And that is the third reason, by the way, is that we want to communicate that we respect a person's personal space because we understand that personal space really equates to an individual's um, self, to their, their physicality. When we get too close to people, it's very similar to touching people. And as we all know, if we're being touched by people at a time or in a way that we don't like, it can be very aggravating. So when we stand too close to people, it has a very similar impa impact. We also have to think about the speed with which we approach people and even the gait that we use. If we're walking too abruptly up to somebody, then particularly if they're in an altered state, they may perceive us as a threat. Consider whether or not it is safe to sit or squat versus standing by an individual. If they're sitting and you're standing, you may be hovering over them in a way that makes them again feel disempowered. An eye position is something that's very, very curious, and you can actually practice this at home. Interestingly, we have expressions in the English language, such as saying, you're looking down on me. And curiously, when we're looking down, we tend to be uh, more emotional. When we're looking straight up, we tend to be more rational. What we want is for a person to have the ability to use their eyes in their full range. That allows them to communicate easily, that allows them to access their emotional state easily, it allows them to use their memory and integrate all of those components equally. If you are standing over a person and making them look straight up at you, then you're only allowing them to, lose, to use their eyes in that one position, especially if you have an expectation of eye contact. Getting down to a person's eye level not only will free up their eyes and allow them to have more cognitive, uh, more cognitive freedom, but it also will simply communicate to a person that you're interested in literally meeting them at their level and being uh, less of an imposing force. And think about your hand activity as well. I realize that you can't see me right now, but for the students who are in class, they'll tell you I'm a pretty 
uh, a frequent hand mover as I speak. If you're that individual, when you're walking up to people, really be mindful of how you put your hands. Where are they as you approach the individual? Can the individual see that your hands are free and that there's nothing in them? As the individual see that your hands are open as opposed to being clenched? And I refer to this sometimes as the Jesus pose. And I'll show you in again another video clip how you can approach people with your hands open and slightly forward for you so that the person can tell that you're really not a threat. Even if you have your hands down at your side and you're marching towards a person, that can be, again, back to the rate of approach, a challenge for some people. So we have to make a particular or deliberate effort to put our hands and our bodies in a position that doesn't say to people they should think of us as a threat. The third element is our paraverbal communication, which can be summed up as everything that we do with our voices other than our words. So this includes the volume of our voice, the cadence, which is basically the speed with which we speak, and our rhythm. When we think about voice volume, really there are only two reasons why human beings typically raise their voice. One of them is because it's loud and people often can't hear until we do that. But the other one is because you use it as a way of amplifying the emotional valent in what we're trying to say. And if we're speaking about something we're not pleased about and start to raise the level of our voice, it will inevitably be perceived that we're more angry. And the louder we get, the more that anger will, be, uh, will come across to people. Here's the challenge. You may be raising the volume of your voice simply because you don't think the person can hear you. Uh, it may be too loud in the surroundings. And when that happens, people may perceive it as a threat gesture. So you have really two choices. One of them is to simply use what we call metacommunication. In other words, communicate about your communication and let that person know, perhaps even remind them more than once, that you're speaking loud just because you're standing on the side of a busy and loud road or because it's a crowded circumstance. But the other thing that you might try to do is just do some environment, environmental manipulation. Try, if it's safe to do so, to have that person go to a place where there's less of a need to yell. Because even with you meta-communicating about the reason for your loud volume, it still occurs for people at an autonomic level that that loud volume starts to cause stress for them as well. And be purposeful about the volume you use even when you're not being really loud. Sometimes, for example, for myself as a fairly large-bodied male, I tend to have a louder voice than the average person in the first place. And I've had people later on say to me, why are you yelling when I didn't think I was yelling? So I have to be particularly mindful of whether or not I might be coming across as being aggressive or coming across just more intensely than a person might be ready to receive. Cadence is the speed with which we speak. And if you think about it, again, the faster we speak, the more it tends to communicate that we're anxious, especially when we're angry. Get to your room right now! As an example of something that you would expect to hear from a family that was a person in a family that was really on the verge of losing it. Whereas if we slow it down, it sounds more patient. Now, if we slow it down too much, it has the opposite effect. Get to your room right now! Or uh, something being explained, being slowed down too much, may make the person feel as though we're saying something stupid, that saying to them that we think they're stupid. Something like, okay, put the flower in with the water right now. And you can hear that that is not only a slow cadence that may make people feel as though you underestimate their intelligence, but it also takes us into the rhythm category. Rhythm is really important. If we speak in that sort of looping rhythm or cadence, it does suggest to people that we underestimate their ability. And we want to make sure we don't do that. So speak to people in a sort of a straightforward rhythm as opposed to, all right, it's time to calm down and then we will talk about this and so forth. By the way, calm down was one of the flag words we could have talked about earlier. And as I said, we will go back to that later. Next, let's talk about something called artifactual attributions. Artifactual attributions are just a fancy way of saying the objects that we carry with us and or wear and the way that they may communicate about us. These are some of the very first things that people look at when they start to decide who we are and whether to trust us. Artifactual attributions include most predominantly our clothing, 
Obviously, if we're wearing a suit, for example, we may be perceived as less approachable or accessible or relatable than a person wearing casual clothing. On the other hand, if you're wearing things that are too casual or are not neat or clean, you may come across as a person who is really not distinguished from an, uh, another per consumer. You want to look like you are still a clean, neat, approachable and reliable person, a person who's together so that the individual can have faith in you. Now, perhaps no particular outfit, no particular type of clothing is more likely to communicate to a consumer than a uniform. And uniforms obviously are not normally optional for people who work in first response or who work in things like a medical capacity. So our intent here is not to suggest that people should abandon their uniforms. There are both positive and negative things that people get from seeing an individual in uniform. First of all, of course, the uniform makes the individual immediately identifiable and the individual who is receiving that person, the consumer, can often decide right away what's okay to ask from that particular professional. But of course, many people have socialized uh, very negatively to uniforms. And they may have done that through direct interactions or through observed interactions or even through social learning by other people. For example, their parents may tell them or their uh, others in a particular cultural group may tell them not to trust individuals from a particular uh, background. And as soon as they see that uniform, they assume that they can't be trusting. Even more troubling, there may be people who make that assumption across a generalization. So any uniform may speak to them that they cannot trust the individual in it. And this might explain, for example, why bus drivers sometimes run into difficulties with consumers because when they ask that consumer to do something, they're being perceived as somebody who is more of a power figure than a service provider. So we cannot do anything to remove the uniform from the equation in many cases. What this simply suggests is that we have to be particularly astute at the other aspects that we are able to toggle or adjust. And so, uh, for example, if you have two people who are going to approach a consumer, both of them wearing the uniform, is there one of those two people who has other attributes like, for example, better communication skills, a relationship with that individual, or perhaps they're not as imposing in terms of their physicality that might make them the one who should make the initial approach? Think about as well the perception of any weapons that you may be required to carry. And again, we're not suggesting that you shouldn't carry your weapons, but is there a way for us to present them in a way that, or present ourselves where the weapons are less evident? For example, uh, can we have um, something slid around to the behind of our belt? Or can we show um, an individual that our hands are not carrying something as we talked about previously? Um, can we make sure that our vocal tone and eye contact are communicating to people that we're not a threat as a way of having them be more focused on that than our weapons. Radios and keys are other major ones and if you're a person who has to wear a radio uh, you might want to ask another uh, attending professional to be the one who manages the radio while you turn yours down or you might want to wear your uh, earpiece or you might simply want to again lower the volume. As for keys once again um, a bundle of keys is something that for many people is the signifier between an institutionalized an institutionalizing professional and themselves and many have had negative experiences about being locked away against their will and uh, they are often conditioned to the idea that once they see keys they cannot trust the individual so it's important if you have a big bundle of keys not to make that the first thing that the individual sees Think about other artifactual attributions that you might bring forward as well. Something as su subtle, I worked with one individual who very much um, wanted to collect three things. Uh, the first one was uh, video cards back in the days. This happened in the days when there were still video stores. Uh, coffee mugs and keys. The keys I've already explained, but the other two when we looked at it were also closely associated with the staff people he had seen over the years. Almost every staff person had some sort of travel mug and he really sort of seemed to believe that those travel mugs were closely tied to being a powerful person. And similarly, identification. And so whenever he had a chance to get some form of identification, such as a video card or a telephone calling card, he really went out of his way to get them. Um, so those are examples of little types of things that a person might see as signifiers that you're an empowered person and they may not be. And that can lead to people engaging in power struggles or conflict with you.
Think as well about the situational elements. We talked about this a little bit when we talked about volume a few moments ago. Think about whether or not you're in a setting, for example, that is attributable to authority. If I said to you when you were a youth, go to the principal's office, often you would have likely right away assumed that you were in trouble. And that's just because of the setting. So when we can go to a setting where the person is going to feel that it's their setting, where they're more comfortable, or at the very least a neutral setting, or even a setting where other people are around sometimes if they're worried about being alone with an authority figure, all of those things can make a difference. Conversely, your setting might not want to be one where you have a lot of different people around, particularly the sorts of individuals who might do things like speak for your consumer or interject or constantly make interruptions so that it's difficult to have any kind of con continuity in your communication. Of course, think about the noise level. Too much noise will, necess will necessitate uh, raising your voice volume and we've spoken about how that can be a challenge. Think about who is present, not just the numbers of people, but is there somebody nearby, for example, uh, who that person trusts well, or who is experienced and has, uh, can be a reliable guide to that individual about what your process is going to be and that they can trust to go through that process. Or a person who's dealt with you in the past and can vouch that you are actually a decent person. Think also about the order of the communication. Who do you speak to first? For example, often we go into a situation where a consumer, um, for example, a family member calls and reports to us that an individual's behaviors become very erratic and dangerous. And it's a natural thing for us to immediately go and speak to that consumer's family and get the story. But if we have another person with us, or if it's at all possible for us to go to that individual first and hear what they have to say before we hear the family, Often, even though we're going to elicit the same information from the family, the information we get from the consumer will be less tainted by defensiveness. Uh, they'll probably be more free to communicate with us. I realize it's not always practically possible to do this. Sometimes we simply don't understand the nature of the complaint at all until we hear it from the person who contacted us. But in many cases, I have found if I speak to the consumer and say, what's happened here? They actually often tell me very directly. And the fact pattern that emerges is much more aligned than you might expect and more aligned than you would get if you'd gone to the family first and said, what's the issue? And then gone and asked the consumer because that consumer may begin automatically telling you all about the things that the first person got wrong in an effort to try and save face or defend themselves. We want to make sure we are very concrete in our communication. We talked a little bit about meta-communication earlier, telling people why we have to speak louder, for example. But concreteness simply means that we're leaving things um, as, uh, as specific as we can be, avoiding the abstract. We know that we respond a great deal to people's uh, nonverbal communication, and uh, we want other people to know how to interpret our nonverbal communication. So let's say, for example, that you are going to leave the room. It's important to let the person know why you're leaving the room so that they don't read into that behavior. If you have to talk to your partner or take a communication, for example, by a phone or radio, letting the other person know, I have to take a, a call now because I have another issue that's going on that's not related to you, um, or I'm going to go and ask your mother something, but don't worry, I promise to come back and I'll let you know what's said and I will hear what you have to say. These types of things can really help reduce a person's anxiety. Let them know your thinking and let them know what you intend to do. And eye contact. You know, we've been taught that eye contact is a very positive aspect of communication. I think we need to be less reliant on the other person communicating to us that they're respecting us and that they're listening to us by using eye contact as an indicator. If you are constantly waiting for people to look you straight in the eye as evidence that they're hearing what you have to say, you are probably going to be frustrated and you're going to spend a lot of your time meta-communicating, telling that person, I need you to look at me, I need you to look at me, when in fact that person may be receiving you quite well without the eye contact. And this again can be a factor of things like autistic spectrum disorders, 
cultural differences, particularly in, in, in uh, Asian cultures and in First Nations cultures, um, or the fact that the person is perhaps under the influence of a substance. The individual may be hearing what you have to say. Look for other indicators of evidence that they're hearing you, as opposed to just eye contact. For example, ask the person questions that will tell you whether or not they're listening to you. Have them repeat it back uh, and take small pieces of information one at a time and see how they respond to those. When you use eye contact with that individual, be aware that they may perceive it as a threat. So we typically have a slightly more sustained period of time of eye-to-eye -eye contact with people that we know trust us and know us. But with an individual who's sort of wary of us, it can be important sometimes to make that eye contact less frequent and shorter in duration. And we're talking about milliseconds of difference as opposed to you know minutes of difference here. So the differences can be very subtle, but you do have to adjust. And as I said, avoid making the other person's eye contact an issue for you. Um, if you're not sure why a person isn't attending to you, ask the individual or ask other people. But if it's something that you don't get an immediate response to, chances are it isn't, uh, it isn't worth making a central issue. I see people often immediately conclude that a lack of eye contact translates into a lack of attention or respect. And that can cause a major breakdown in a communication for no real reason. Often the person that's taking it that way is simply misperceiving it. So taking a look at these seven areas and thinking about how they suit your individual communication is, in my opinion, one of the most basic things that we can do to improve our interactions with people both during crisis or any time we're initiating a relationship. These little things can play a big role. Any discussion we might have about relationship building and relational behaviors needs to take a moment to look at trauma-informed care. So what is trauma-informed care? Well, when we talk about people suffering from historical trauma, what we're referring to is the notion that people who may have been as, a, as identifiable uh, cultural groups been subjected to institutionalization may continue generations later to have uh, major impacts as a result of those social traumas, even in people who have not themselves been directly institutionalized. So we think about this probably most prominently when we think about people of First Nations backgrounds uh, for whom the institutionalization took place in the form of residential schools or the reserve system. But it is also true of other groups, for example, cultural groups such as people of a Japanese or Asian descent period, Indo-Canadian groups and so forth, and of groups that are identified based on, uh, for example, disabilities, such as people with developmental disabilities who were institutionalized in places like Woodlands uh, School, or people who were deaf, for example, who might have been um, institutionalized in places like Jericho Hill, or not so much here in British Columbia, but in other parts of Canada, we might even talk about people who lived through orphanage uh, abuses at orphanages and so forth. Now, these forms of trauma came as a result of the both the systematic and endorsed approaches that happened in these environments and sometimes often by things that even in their day would have been considered illicit behavior but might have been uh, hidden away or, or uh, silently tolerated in these environments such as chronic abuse. So we're going to talk about that more as we move into the next lecture and before that as always I'd like you to spend a moment in your journals. So in your journal, answer the following and take about five minutes to write and take a moment to review what others have said or review it with your partners. In your opinion, is there any validity to the idea that historical wrongs can have a negative impact on the mental health and social welfare of people today? And why or why not? And if historical trauma is a factor, is there anything that first responders can do about it? Take a moment and write those answers and reflect on them and then move on to the next section.